We pour out our praise, it's your breath and our love. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath and our love. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath and our love. So we pour. up. You are in. 
beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed
chair back there or anything, did you? You went and sat down with him. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord. It is so good to be with you here today. I just want you to know that the Lord never stops working. That in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of trials, that we, what we see sometimes is not at all what's going on. And so I just want to encourage you to lift up the name of the Lord, who is a strong tower, and run into Him. Run into His comfort, run into His truth, run into the fact that He is the one who ordains our life and brings out good from sometimes very difficult situations. Let's stand and raise a hallelujah to the Lord who reigns in, in His love and grace. Lord God, we raise a hallelujah.
may be seated. Sharon has some announcements for us. Good morning. Woo! All right. We are looking forward to the Christmas shoe boxes um, that we do every December. And so, Ryan, you want to go ahead and um, give us a little video on that as a reminder of what it's all about. are so excited giving them a gift do it in jesus name and that's what this is all about jesus loves you it's a gospel opportunity is the chance for the children to change the entire life the word of god is spreading the gospel is advancing it is impacting children it is impacting families it is impacting the world greatly Thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. God will bless, and God will use your gift to touch the life of a child and to be able to do it in Jesus' name. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. God bless each and every one of you. All right. So there are some boxes out in the lobby today if you want to pick one up. We're also encouraging you. We'll have some bins out there if you want to just bring the items because we want the kids in a kids' church to experience putting those into shoe boxes also. So if you just want to bring the uh, shoe, the toys and things like that, there will be bins out in the lobby. Otherwise, go ahead and take some boxes, and there's lots more if, they, if we run out out there. And then the collection will be in November, so we have a, a few weeks to do that. Also, we had such a great time. The women, we had 17 women here last Thursday for the Art and App Night, and it was so much fun. So we're going to have another one coming up. But also, ladies, there's a couple things for you. Um, this Tuesday night, if you want to join us for a Zoom tea, um, there's some people, um, women, that are still not able to join us here. So we have those Zoom teas to just have a, you know, so there's a game and just some of uh, the fun question of the week this time is if you were able, uh, which Bible person would you want to have for dinner and besides Jesus? And what would you cook? So that's what we're going to be doing, part of that. And then we'll have games and um, just a fun time of women getting together. That's the Zoom tea this Tuesday, October 13th. And you can uh, go on the update, and that will give you the link to it um, to go with that. The walk this week, the Wednesday walk, is at the um, the Senior Center on Pacific. That's, uh, what is that park called? Wonder, one something. Wood Lake. Woodland. <laughs> Yeah, Woodland. Okay, so we're going to meet there noon to one. Um, ladies and kids, just a little time for you to get away, have a little lunch break um, from the homeschooling thing too, if you want. So, and then um, Belinda has a couple announcements also for us. Good morning, church family. Um, a couple announcements. Last week you heard about the trunk or treat, and that is happening from noon till 2 p.m. on October 31st, just as an outreach for the community. Um, so if you are coming, uh, we put it on the Facebook page. You can click I'm coming and we can know how many people to expect. Or if you want to decorate a car, there's signups outside. And there are, uh, there's an insert in your bulletin to, to remind you. But these little uh, flyers are for you to invite neighbors or friends um, who kind of like, I don't know what we're going to do this Halloween. And so it's during the daytime. We're going to have social distance and everything. And just um, we want to know if you're going to bring a car and just something that we can outreach to the community and um, connect with them. Bible-themed cars would be great, too. Uh, so get into that for the kids. Um, and also, if you see me around with a camera, I'm trying to take some pictures to update our directory. If you'd like your info to be in there or your picture to be in there, please come see me or send it to realhopelacy at gmail.com so we can have an accurate directory so that we can get to know one another better. Um, last announcement for the youth, this Friday we are meeting for our youth group, large group meeting. We meet every third Friday of the month uh, where we have the large groups. 
and we are going to be getting ready for our hunger buster ministry. So while everybody's going out trick-or-treating, we will be, of course, collecting some candy as well, but we are gonna go around and collect canned goods or non-perishable foods. Uh, we'll put them in the boxes, let them quarantine for a while, and then we're gonna donate them to the Union Gospel Mission. So if that's something that you feel like you want to be a part of, we need adult drivers because our youth can't drive yet. <laughs> um, and we'll be passing out some flyers just to let them know that we want to help take the scare out of hunger and that we're praying for the families in the community. So something that we want to be, um, you know, just doing something active to show the community that we care about them. So if you want to sign up, please tear out the little card in your bulletin and check that box off or respond on the email. Thank you. Let's pray for the offering right now. Father God, we come before you. The God of the universe, you are so holy and amazing and so generous. And Lord, we fall short of your glory every day. But Lord, you know, you know us, and yet you love us so much, and you pour out your blessings. So right now, Lord, we just want to offer back just a small token of appreciation of what you've given us. And Lord, um, would, you, would you bless this that's given out of faith, and would you make it further your kingdom? We thank you for your glory, in Jesus' name.
better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you.
say to the Lord, all my life you have been so, so good, every breath that I am able, yes, Lord, all I would say of the goodness of God, all my life, all my life, Lord, all my life you have been saved. But number two, I want you to realize that they, they know the Lord. They experience it's not just some lesson they're teaching. They know the Lord. And uh, as I said before, a, 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 a mind can change a mind. We can change people's minds. But what we want really is heart change. And the people that are teaching your, your children, are um, they know the Lord from their heart. And so if anybody can uh, affect your kids uh, along with the Holy Spirit, it would be these teachers that, are, that are, we're privileged to have at, at our church at Real Hope. So sit back and enjoy what the Lord is going to do for your kids. And, and as we open our heart to what the Lord wants to tell us and teach us this morning, I just want to, let's turn to um, Psalm chapter 34. Psalm chapter 34. I need to do something different, Ryan. Okay, okay. Well, I'm going to go on a little bit about my wife this morning. <laughs> I said, I'm going to talk about you a little bit this morning. No. <laughs> my, my wife, Sharon, is what you might want to call talented. She paints beautiful pictures. She cooks all sorts of yummy foods. Um, many of you have enjoyed her piano playing this morning. 
Uh, she's a joy to be around, and I have the privilege to be called her husband. That is a privilege for me. When I met Sharon, one of the first things that I noticed about her is how, um, how incredibly comfortable I felt around her. She, was, she put me at ease, and um, uh, we enjoy just talking and walking and, and you know, going on walks and going to the health food store, and uh, we'd go and get little healthy snacks <laughs> at the health food store. And... Um, we would sit in the car and just talk for hours. There was a place in, in like near the Admiral District in Seattle, if you know that area of the world. And there's this place called Lookout Point. And the city of Seattle, you know it, the city of Seattle uh, has this beautiful place kind of up high on the, on the west side of Seattle. You can look at downtown and the, and the lights of the, of the office building glimmer in the, in the Puget Sound. It's just so nice. And we would talk for hours there. Or, or sometimes we'd just watch the lights. Or, or sometimes we wouldn't watch the lights or talk at all. We'd, we'd just kiss. And so... <laughs> She found different ways to tell me that she liked me. One time she sent me one of those singing telegrams. And I don't know, uh, from the moment that the singing telegram, there was this like quick process that I, I went through. I mean, like it happened in a matter of seconds. I thought, I'm going to be so embarrassed. This is going to be so embarrassing to me. I just, you know, and, but then when I understood, when the lady said, who was singing this, oh, this is from Sharon uh, Frederick, excuse me. <laughs> she wasn't my wife yet. Sharon Frederick. And I thought, and I just totally relaxed. It was like, oh, it's from her. Oh, I'm going to enjoy this. It was different. It was just different. And I really enjoyed what she did. And I, I really liked it. And, and I remember one time when I was six, she made me this huge card about this wide and about this tall. And she had, with a color crane, she had picked a, um, paint, or, uh, drew, drawn uh, a picture of Uncle Sam with his stern face like this with his finger pointed out. And, but at the bottom it said, I want you. And I'm going like, <laughs> and, then, and on the inside it says to feel better and when she hand delivered that card I was miraculously healed <laughs> no I got better and, and it was you know I just I was so encouraged by that and after we got married she still found ways creative ways to tell me that she loves me I worked uh, probably the first uh, decade of our marriage I worked in, in printing and sales and advertising and that kind of stuff and um I was working at this print shop, and they had, I don't know if, if you know printing, but Heidelberg Presses, anybody know Heidelberg Presses? Okay, well, it's a special kind of press, printing press, and we had one of those at our work, and I was particularly attached to it. I was not a printer, but I was in the sales department, I, but I liked that press, and so she made me a birthday cake that looked like a Heidelberg Press, and it was like, it was really cool, and so when I walked in with this cake, the guys go like, oh my goodness, <laughs> and I was like, proud of my wife you know like, it's my wife that made you know it, just, it was so fun and uh but that was the kind of special things that she would do all the time and our kids grew up in that sort of environment where she let them just sort of experiment and do things uh, creatively she um you know where they could experiment at cooking and playing the piano and being a radio personality and planting a garden and singing and playing the drums and painting and drawing and decorating and making all sorts of surprises of their own because she, they were around a very creative mom. One time, our kids created this their own little restaurant and Joy, our oldest, was the, was the owner of the restaurant and the cook. And Anna, our, our middle child, our, our youngest daughter, she was the waitress and Joel... Um, was the maitre d', and he loved that, having the towel over his, and dressing up and all that stuff. And so we got to uh, be treated that night to just uh, their, their restaurant that they had created, their food and their you know, ambiance and all the lights and everything that they, that they created. And that was really fun. Another time when Sharon and I came home from a date, we drove up the driveway and the, the, uh, the garage door opened, and standing in front of us were our three kids with a TV set there that they had gotten, I think, down from the living room and, and a VCR player. If you don't know what a VCR player, that means you're a lot younger than I am. Anyway, <laughs> but they created in our garage a drive-in movie. <laughs> so it was just their creative mind working. And it was wonderful to be treated uh, you know, like that. But it was an expression, a secondhand sort of expression of who my wife was for me and, and for our kids. 
When I was getting my degree, we needed to be very creative with our income because I had to go to school full time and I couldn't really hold down a, a, a part, even a part time job because of the, just the way the school was structured. And so Sharon says, let's deliver papers. And I thought, ooh, I, I wasn't really sure how that would work. Yeah. <laughs> so at 3.45 in the morning, Sharon and I would get out of bed. I would run to the, to the distribution shack or whatever, pick up the papers and come home and we would bag them and do all whatever, get ready. And by 5.45, we would be done with our four paper routes and I would fall back into bed and Sharon would be getting out pots and pans and other things so that she could make hand-dipped beeswax candles. She would do that all day. And I would come home about 3.30, 3.45, and I would work on my homework from 3 that time till about 6.30, at which time she would hand me a basket, send me out the door, and I'd be knocking on the doors from 6.30 to 8.30, and that's how the Lord provided a, a piece of our income. And, but the thing you've got to understand, getting up at 3.45 every day, it was a challenge to me, and I'm a morning person. Sharon is not a morning person. She is a night person. And so that was just a particularly wonderful expression of her love for me so, and to make it possible for me to get uh, you know, through school and get my degree. Now, she's probably getting very embarrassed at this point, saying, Bob, you're going on and on about me. Well, you got to the message. This is the message, my love. <laughs> In ministry, she is my right arm and half my left. My teammate, my encourager, Sharon is my faithful companion. She keeps herself from me alone. She's my best friend. She's my prayer partner. She is there to cheer me on through tough times so we can celebrate the victories together. I have someone who loves me, who prays for me, who cherishes me, who's faithful to me, who chooses me every day over every other guy in the whole world. I have a great wife. Yeah. Okay, I'll stop now. <laughs> now, since I have a wife like that, I, am, I promise I will stop. <laughs> Do you think it might be appropriate for me to brag on her a little bit? To let my neighbors and my friends and my co-workers and my, you know, people in my life and, and just express that to them? Do you think that would be the natural thing to do? Do you think that would be just the, the natural outcome of having a wife so wonderful? And, and I would say to my own question, yes, absolutely. And that's what David says he's going to do. That's what David says how he's going to respond to, to God's blessing in his life. That, that's what David says, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell people. I'm going to brag about God. He says his con his praise will continually be in my mouth. David is saying, no matter what is going on, I am going to praise God and not let anything or anyone distract me from doing that or discourage me from doing that or shame me because I do that or deter me from worshiping God. All my life he's been faithful, David would say. So all my life I will continually praise him. I'm going to always be telling people how awesome God is, how he has always loved me, how good he's been to me, and how kind in every way, and how he has been generous to me, and how his generosity just goes on and on and on. Can you all say, yeah? That's, a, that's an unchurchy word for amen. <laughs> David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. That's verse 1. Verse 2 says, My soul will make its boast in the Lord. I want you to understand this word boast. It, it, it's, it's not just to brag like one time. It's like it's like brag and keep on bragging and keep on bragging to such a degree that to some people you might look foolish. It's like what you call a brag fest. David says essentially, I am going to post a brag fest for God. I'm going to go online and I'm going to put it on Facebook. I'm going to go on Twitter and brag about God there. I'm going to go to Instagram and show how good God's been to me. I'm going to go everywhere I can. I'm going to go to church and tell people how, God, how good God's been to me. I'm going to go to my neighbors and tell them how good. God. David says, I'm going to have a brag fest. 
My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. 1 Corinthians talks about maybe being a little bit foolish about this. 1 Corinthians 1, 6, or 18 says something about a person looking foolish when they believe in the Lord. It says, for the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. But to us who believe, we got any believers in here? Yeah, to us who believe, it is the power of God. Some people might feel embarrassed or shamed when others don't understand. But Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. In other words, hey, it's the only way I could have been saved. And I would say it's the only way I could be saved. It's the only way you could be saved. So there's no reason for me to be ashamed. It's the only place I can go to to be saved. Therefore, I will brag on God about His power about His love for me, about His forgiveness, about His grace. If you've never experienced, though, or if you've never noticed or taken into account or really thought through the logic of the fact that you can't be here by yourself, you can't exist by yourself, you you could not have arrived at this point in your existence without somebody outside of you you know, and I'm not talking even about your parents because your parents didn't set up the, the system inside your, your mom and your dad to create you. They did not set that system of physiology up. They don't support their own cells. They cannot even keep themselves alive. So it's not your parents. It's not your grandparents or your great-grandparents or even Adam and Eve. It's God alone who created this world, who set up everything within your parents to make it possible for you to be here. And as you sit here and struggle with your face mask, remember that you are breathing. <laughs> that reminds me a lot. I'm breathing. Every time I, I'm, I'm kind of a, you know, uh, I breathe a lot when I sing. And this face mask is really in my way. I want to take it off so badly. <laughs> <laughs> and it really makes me conscious of the fact that I'm breathing. But where did that breath come from? This planet has no lid on it. There's no way somebody can just inject atmosphere into it. God, by His own strength, by His own wisdom, by His own uh, knowledge, created this place in a way so that we could have beautiful sky, go into outer space, and still have this, this atmosphere here to breathe. That was God did that all by Himself. And so if you've never thought about the fact that God gave you life by His will, by his wisdom, by his knowledge, and that every moment he's sustaining you. He, when you go to sleep at night and your heart keeps on beating, you're not doing that. God is doing that. When you involuntarily breathe at night, you don't even think about it. You don't even think about it, and yet God is sustaining your life. If you've never thought that you have experienced God or or notice God, or maybe it's better to just say, if you've never really begun acknowledging God's goodness, all this worship might seem just like, what in the world is this? Why do the people do this? We have done this, we do this every Sunday because we have come face to face with Him who loves us and has never stopped loving us. We have experience and we keep on experiencing the goodness of God every ray of sunshine every good and perfect thing comes from God so it just makes sense for us to keep worshiping the Lord but it says the humble will hear and rejoice when the humble people who say yeah God is the one who has done this they look across the aisle and see worshipers and saying yep yep that's right and they they, it says the humble will hear and rejoice. When, when you know something's right and it's really good and wonderful and amazing and, and life-changing and you see that played out in front of you, there's something that it does to you. It makes you rejoice in your heart. And that's what David is saying. And that's why David invites the humble in verse 3 with these words, magnify the Lord with me then. And let's exalt his name together. Magnify in this sense means to speak of God in a way that shows how magnificent he is. You know, in worship, um, 
you know, in worship on Sunday morning. Sometimes somebody will just shout something out. Thank you, Lord. Or, God, you're so good. And it's not up here on the what I call the script. It's, it's not nothing that's written up here. It's just bursting out of their heart. The humble will hear that and rejoice. Like, yes, yeah, somebody really gets it. Somebody's feeling it. To magnify is to speak or sing about God in a way that makes Him real to people. Magnifying God brings God into focus. When people see the boldness and the, the confidence that you have in the Lord, they're saying, whoa, that, that's real. There's something going on in that person's life. And, 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 and your bold, confident worship makes that real to people. They, 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 I've, you know, a lot of people you go into some churches and they're like, you know, their, their singing is like, do you really believe what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, it's like, I remember our choir director said, stop, you know, l- look, listen to what you are singing. And, and he says, and he'd bring out the same and say, do you believe that? It, and then he'll say, sing it, now, now sing it like you believe it. And it would totally change the whole tone of the choir. The pitches would be the same, the rhythm would be the same, the song would be the same. The, the lyrics would be the same. Nothing would change except the tone and the, the intensity about which we would sing. And we'd, we'd all be going like, yeah, that's it. That's it. And when you go into, when, when, when people come into our church, what I want people, how I want people to respond is there's something that's different here. That they, this is real. When we worship with our heart, when we rejoice with our heart, the humble people will go like, wait a minute, this is real. When we magnify the Lord through our lives, when, when the Lord becomes, when we become like a magnifying glass and we, we put the focus on the Lord in our worship, that's when God be, begin, begins to become real to people. When a diamond dealer looks at a diamond He uses a magnifying glass so that all the fine qualities of the diamond come into focus. There's something else I want I want to say to you that that you may come into church, you know, um, and and everything's going great, and you know it's going to be an easy day to really lift up the Lord. But but other weeks you might be coming into church and saying something like, "I need church. I need church this morning." Because you know that when the worship begins, it's not an emotional experience, although we connect emotionally with it. But what I'm saying, it, it, it's a heart-to-heart experience. And when you begin to lift the Lord up and do as David says, I will bless the Lord. The, the Lord's praise will always be in my mouth. And when you start to, to, to sing, those words and those words come from your heart and you say, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. You do something for that person who's like dragging into church and their spirit starts to, starts to grow stronger and, and they, they start to go like, oh yeah, I am remembering. I'm remembering God is good. And you begin to revive. You talk, people talk about wanting revival. I tell you what, every Sunday morning is a revival because sometimes people, some people will come into church and they will need, they will need to know, they will need to hear from you about the goodness of God and your praise and your worship bring their believing heart but hurting heart, their eyes of their heart into focus. You give in worship, not only to the Lord, but to each other. It says, exalt the Lord together. Exalt the Lord together. There's something about about having Zoom worship that just bites. (laughs) Which is like, no, we can't do it that way. I mean, I understand, you know, that's a good tool, and there are certain reasons why we needed to do that. But man, I was so excited to be able to come back together because of what we all give to the Lord together and how we 
we exalt, we, we lift each other up. We, we build each other up in worship. So important for us to be together. So beneficial, so encouraging to be together. Exalt the Lord with me and let us, uh, pardon me, uh, um, praise the Lord together. <laughs> I lost my place. <laughs> Magnify the Lord and let His exalt His name together. Verse 4 says, I sought the Lord and He answered me and delivered me from all my fears. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his, all his troubles. I sought the Lord. There's an action here that takes place. It's called seeking the Lord. Seeking the Lord is is saying, Lord, I, I don't know what to do here. I don't know what to do right now. And what you do is you open the Bible and say, God, what is it that you that you that I need to see from you? And you seek what the Lord says about a situation. Lord, I, whether it's might be like, Lord, I, I struggle with my anger. Um, I need to know how to get free of this. Lord, I, I, I struggle with lust or I struggle with jealousy or struggle, struggle, some sort of struggle and, and you, look, you know that you've tried to fix yourself, so to speak. But you need to know what the Lord is and so you begin to seek the Lord, you pursue the Lord and so you open the Word. A lot of times we can go online, go on Google and go like, what can I do about anger? And we get psychological information or we get you know, counselors or whatever. And counsel is good, but is it what the Lord is saying? Because the Lord created you the Lord created you to be free. The Lord created you for joy. The Lord created you for freedom. The Lord created you uh, to enjoy His abundant life that He's giving. So isn't it right that we should seek the Lord? I sought the Lord, and He delivered me from all fear. Lord, I'm, I'm afraid of what's going to happen in this situation. And we begin to Say, Lord, I need to hear from you. And we open the word. And we pursue the Lord. We seek the Lord. And it says, I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. We live in a very much a shortcut culture. Fast food, fast Results. If things don't work out now, uh, I'm out of here. If things don't work out in the way that I want them to, I'm out of here. If things don't are not as rewarding, I'm out of here. And and then you have that. That's just the disappointment layer. Then you got the layer that is like you actually did something wrong, and I'm out of here. And I understand that 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 that's difficult when people do that. But God is bigger than our disappointment. God is bigger than our fears. God is bigger than the failures of other people. Sometimes God brings you into a situation that is not perfect. Do we have any perfect situations? Why aren't situations perfect? Because the people in them are not perfect. We expect other people, sometimes we demand other people, we demand more out of other people than we demand out of ourselves. And so we go into a situation saying, oh, this is a good situation for me. Oh, this will work out for me. And we're, we are on that, we're on that page. We're on the page of self-fulfillment instead of on the page of like, what can God do through me while I submit to Him, while I allow Him to work through me. We can go into marriage that way. We look to the other person to fulfill our need. We look to the other person to, to make us happy. We look to the other person. And so when they disappoint us, man, we are just like struggling to stay. And there are a bunch of different situations. How are we approaching that? But if we're, see... I sought 
the Lord. When we go into a job, when we go into marriage, when we go into a, a neighborhood, when we go into a school, when we go into a church, are we going into that church? When we go into a ministry opportunity, are we looking for what the Lord is going to get out of us? Or are we looking at what we're going to get out of it? It's very different when we seek the Lord. Because when we seek the Lord, we're seeking somebody that's perfect. We're seeking somebody that's consistent. We're seeking somebody that doesn't, uh, doesn't change. We're seeking somebody that, that, whose love lasts and whose faithfulness never stops. But if we're looking for a job or a marriage or, or an opportunity or a, a, you know, a new neighborhood to get a fresh start, and we're going into that hoping that, like I moved into this neighborhood because it was this and this and this. And I understand that there's some wisdom in that. But beyond that, you got to remember, these people are human. These people are human and, and neighborhoods change. And when you get to know people, they're stuff. <laughs> right? They're just stuff. There's stuff in everybody's house. There's stuff behind everybody's door. But when you seek the Lord, <laughs> He says, I stand at your door and knock. And if you let me come in, we'll have fellowship. We'll, it'll be good. And uh, when you're seeking the Lord, he, he, um, he, he, he already said who He is. He's always been who He's always been. He's not changing. So I sought the Lord and He delivered me from all my fears. There's something about relying on the Lord. There's something about trusting the Lord. There's something about, uh, something about saying, God, how do you want this to go? How do you want me to do this? that puts everything sort of in a place where God is God in you. <laughs> it's not you and, and somebody you're, you're trying to seek out to fulfill your needs. And that's really the basis for the ability to worship. Because when you're seeking the Lord, when you're pursuing the Lord as your source of fulfillment and also your source of direction and your source of security and your source of significance and your source of joy and your source of everything that you desire in your life that and you make him the one who fulfills it things change in really great ways people aren't necessarily going to treat you differently people might ask you how's your day going say well it's not going good but god's treating me really well god's got my back God's taking care of me. It's all good. <laughs> See, when you pursue the Lord, He has a way of taking and delivering you from all your fear. Because like that old hymn says, on Christ, the solid rock, I stand all other ground is sinking miry sand. And you have no idea how that's going to turn out. But when you're standing on the solid rock of Christ, it's, that's where you get delivered from all your fears. I will bless the Lord at all times. That's when you start saying, oh, I'm staying here. I'm staying right here. I'm standing right here. Because this is a solid place that doesn't change. I don't have to wonder about God changing on me. And all of a sudden, what starts to well up inside of you is confidence and peace and rest. And you look to the Lord, and He's always there. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise then will continually be in my mouth. It's the kind of praise that the humble will hear and rejoice. And God will begin to invite people along your side to worship with you. People will notice and people say, there's something about you that I long for. Can I just hang out with you?
I sought the Lord, and He answered me and delivered me from all my fear. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his trouble. I want to sing that song again, The Goodness of God. As we do that, I just want you to, as we sort of begin to enter that song in our, on a heart level, I want you to just think back on the Lord and His goodness for you. But even more than that, I want you to ask yourself, where am I standing right now? Where am I standing? Am I standing on the solid rock of Christ? And I'm not talking about, are you saved? Because we can get saved and go like, oh, good, that's taken care of. I'm going to heaven. And then we can run off and do stuff where we're not on the solid rock. We're, we're seeking something else. We, we've got the Lord now. We conquered that. And now we are moving on to something else. And Paul says, don't be moved off your confidence. Don't, don't move away from your confidence, but stay in the Lord. And then he basically just points out, because that's the place of security. Because God's always going to be faithful. He's always going to be kind. He's always going to be taking care of your needs and some of your wants. But as we move away from the Lord, that's when life gets kind of frightening. That's when our insecurities arise. But on Christ the solid rock, we can stand forever and be secure. Let's stand. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never failed me all my days. I've been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and in darkest night you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Oh, my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I the good hands of God.
God, every moment, every day, from before we were even born, or we were in our mother's womb, Lord, and all the way till now, Lord God, you have always been so good. Let the people of God always acknowledge, and Lord God, as we, as we visit with each other now in fellowship, may that be the thing that is on our lips. As David says, I will continually be praising the Lord. The, the praise of the Lord will continually be in my mouth. Lord, let that be the case in our church. And as we leave this place, may that be the case. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God, we acknowledge that you have given us, you've spoken to us, and given us the words of life, and you breathe into our lungs the breath of life, and because of that we live. And every morning that you wake us up, Lord God, we're excited because we have the breath of life in our lungs, and with that breath, Lord, we want to praise you, we want to worship you. This morning, that's what we come here to do. Let's stand and worship the Lord. You give life. You are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord, oh, it's your breath. Yeah. 
Yes, we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath and our love. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath and our love. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath and our love. So we pour. from our heart.